Hello YouTube, my name is Kyle Benitez and this video is going to be on my B-Traumatic theory. So basically I'm going to tell you guys a lot about the history of the B-Traumatic transit. Hopefully I'll debunk some of the common misconceptions and I'll basically be sharing my theory and the information I've gathered to conclude that some of this tunnel may not have been demolished and it still could exist underneath the corner of Broadway and Morn Street. So. The corner building that we are looking at right now is 258 Broadway. This is not the same building, but it is the exact location where the Beach Traumatic Transit used to be located. Before I go into detail about my theory and why I believe the tunnel might still exist, it's important for you guys to understand a little bit of the history of the Beach Traumatic Transit. And you can see from my eyes why I'm so infatuated with this topic. So let's go back to the 1860s and I'll tell you a little bit about the history. This building at the corner with the five windows and the awning at the bottom, this is the current location of 258 Broadway. Back in 1869, this building was known as the Devlin's Clothing Store and the address was 260 Broadway. It was in the basement of this building that was leased out to Alfred Beach and his Fumatic Transit Company where they would be constructing the tunnel from the corner of Warren Street to Murray Street. You may be asking, who is Alfred Ely Beach, the man behind the Fumatic Transit? Alfred Ely Beach is best known for being the creator of the first subway in New York City, the Beach Fumatic Transit. He was also an inventor. One of his most notable inventions having to do with the Fumatic Transit was Beach's circular tunneling shield, which was an adaptation from different tunneling shields that were rectangular, which were used to build tunnels around London at the time. Most notably, Beach was the publisher and writer of the Scientific American for almost 50 years, which was a tradition that would be carried on by his sons and grandsons. Frederick Converse Beach was Alfred Beach's eldest son. He would be one of the people who would take over Alfred Beach's position at the Scientific American after he passed away. Frederick Converse Beach will come into play later when workers uncover the tunnel years after his father's death and more than 50 years after the tunnel was sealed. Now let's go back to the very beginning. In the time of Beach, the fastest mode of transportation in New York City was horse and carriage. Beach was an innovator and since a young age always had a dream and a vision of being able to transport people from one destination to another underground. Beach had developed his own design based off of the Fumatic subways in London at the time. But before we get into the establishment of the Beach Fumatic Transit Company in 1868, a lot of people don't know that before the New York subway tunnel was built, Beach had tested his designs elsewhere for the American Institute Fair of 1867, which was basically like the 1964 World's Fair of the Gilded Age. Alfred Beach would finance two demonstrations of the Fumatic Dispatch, one which was a postal mail dispatch, which would demonstrate the power of Fumatic tubes, and the other was big enough for passengers to ride in. The fair ran from September 12th to October 26th, 1867. The Scientific American would describe it as, although this demonstration helped to show people the practicality of Alfred Beach's designs, Alfred Beach was not properly recognized in the media, so Beach had to do more to show the public that there was a need for his designs. In 1868, Beach would come in contact with a man by the name of Joseph Dixon. Dixon, like Beach, was an inventor. Dixon had designed his own iron cast tunnel, which he believed could be used to build underground railways. Alfred Beach was an engineer and knew a lot about fumatic power, but he was not a tunnel builder. Having Dixon was a very important asset to Beach because now he had somebody who knew how to build tunnels. Dixon's iron cast tunnel design would be present in the Beach Fumatic Tunnel, and it will play an important role towards the end of the video and in my Fumatic theory. In January of 1868, Alfred Beach would release a promotional booklet called the Fumatic Dispatch. This booklet contains Beach's ideas and some really dope illustrations that show an elevated Fumatic transit. On June 18, 1868, the Beach Fumatic Transit Company would become official. Here is directly from the source, the owners and the directors. Note that Alfred Beach and Joseph Dixon 
are owners of the company. This company was not incorporated under the railroad law of 1850, so it technically wasn't a railroad company. This meant that under law, the Beatrumatic Transit Company could not transport passengers because there was nothing in the law that implied that right. Beach was not the only company being founded at this time with the goals of building an underground or elevated subway to transport people from one destination to another. Another company created around this time was the New York City Central Underground Railroad, which would later become Alfred Beach's main competitor in an expansion to the subway. Almost a year after the original demonstration line, on December 1st, 1868, the Beach Rheumatic Transit Company would take a five-year lease of the basement of the Devlin's Clothing Store. Now Beach had his design, his tunnel builder in Dixon, and the location at 260 Broadway. All he had to do was find a way to legally build his demonstration line. Little did people know that before Beach had permission to build his bigger tunnel at the corner of Warren Street, at the location of 260 Broadway, Beach first built a small fumatic tube which was meant to travel mail using fumatic power. Although the original purpose and intention of this mail tube never came to light, there is a Tribune story from January of 1870 that mentions this smaller tube in the basement of 260 Broadway. The legal finagling by Alfred Beach starts with the construction of the larger tube and the one that we know from the Beach Rheumatic Transit. In May of 1869, the Beach Rheumatic Transit Company was given permission to build their larger tunnel from Warren Street under Broadway down to Murray Street. This idea that Beach would build this larger tunnel in order to fit two fanatic tubes inside for sending mail was a false conception. Instead, Beach wanted to build this tunnel big enough to fit passengers inside and hopefully in the future he would be able to gain a charter and public approval for a passenger railway. Shortly after the charter was granted in May of 1869, work would begin on the construction of the Beach Fumatic Tunnel underneath Broadway. Beach would look to his old friend from the American Institute Fair that he built the demonstration line with, William Holsk, to supply the blower, and he would rely on his friend Joseph Dixon, the secretary of the company, to build a portion of the tunnel, which would be built using Dixon's cast iron tunnel design. Dixon would also supervise the building of the tunnel since he was the engineer and knew all about building tunnels. For the building of this tunnel, Beach would look back to his old invention, his tunneling shield, in order to build the Broadway tunnel. This tunneling shield was cylindrical, which was different from the rectangular designs that were used in the tunnels to build London. This tunneling shield would play a big part in the discovery of the Beach Tunnel in 1912 and we'll see some pictures of this tunneling shield during the demolition later on in the video. The construction of the Beach Rheumatic Tunnel from the corner of Warren Street under Broadway to Murray Street would take around 55 days. This would make sense because it was told that the workers would work day and night. During the day, you would see Mr. Dixon and Alfred Beach supervising the workers. During the night, Alfred Beach would give the permission of supervising the workers to his 21-year-old son, Frederick Converse Beach. At its completion, the tunnel was 294 feet long, the iron portion was 57 feet, and the brick was 237 feet. On the map, I highlighted the iron portion of the tunnel, which was built using Dixon's iron cast tunnel design. The unhighlighted section is the regular brickwork of the tunnel. This is how the Fumatic Transit used to work. The engine in the boiler rooms would power the blower. The blower was basically like a huge fan that would blow air into the tunnel. If I could describe how this tunnel would work the best, think of a straw. When you suck on a straw, the liquid comes up. And when you blow on the straw, the liquid comes down. So basically, the transit system was a bigger version of this. The fan was basically your mouth and the tunnel was the straw. So the fan would blow air into the tunnel and the train would go down into the tunnel into Murray Street. Once the car reached Murray Street, it was a dead end and the train would signal to the worker that the train was at the end of the tunnel. Knowing this, the worker would reverse the fan. Reversing of the fan would create a suction effect that would pull the car from the dead end at Murray Street back into the station at Warren Street. 
Shortly after this tunnel was complete, the Beachumatic Transit Company would look to sparkle up the basement of 260 Broadway for public access. During the end of 1869, the company would also install the remaining technology to power the Fumatic Transit, including the blower and the engines and the boilers. I would also like to note that the best story is that this subway, the Beachumatic Transit, was built in complete secrecy. I hate to say it, but this is most likely a false conception because Broadway was one of the busiest streets in New York at the time. Based off of the sources from newspapers, definitely the journalists and the people who were around the area of Broadway knew that something was going on underneath the streets and something was being built. It is important to go back and remember that the Beach Rheumatic Transit Company was not an official transit company under their original charter to build the tunnel. So through this demonstration line, Alfred Beach was hoping to gain public approval to gain a new charter in order to expand his subway from Battery Park and up to Harlem. By February of 1870, the Beachumatic Transit Company had completed its preparations and was ready for public viewing. On Saturday, February 26, 1870, the Beachumatic Transit Company would have its first reception where they would invite state and city officials and the press for the first public showing of the Beachumatic Transit Tunnel. By Tuesday, March 1st of 1870, the Beachumatic Transit Company would allow the public to ride the train from Warren Street to Murray Street and back for a small donation to charity of 25 cents. The invited guests would receive this card above. Here's an excerpt from a Tribune reporter about his visit to 260 Broadway in the Beachumatic Transit Tunnel in 1870. The biggest attraction of the sub-basement at 260 Broadway and the Beachumatic Transit Company include the train, which was upholstered with all the finest technology and comforts you could expect in 1870. The waiting room, which included all the amenities anyone could ever wish for in 1870, including a fountain with a fish pond and a grand piano, as well as the walls being beautifully painted in white with wooden upholstery. This room was really gorgeous and Alfred Beach really had something going for him with the Beach Rheumatic Transit Company in the Warren Street Station. In just the first two weeks the Beach Rheumatic Transit Company was open, the company would bring home around $2,805 in ticket sales. At this time, Beach had the public approval he needed to expand his idea and build his subway like he dreamed down to Battery and up to Harlem. All Beach needed was to bring his idea to legislature and hope that they would side with him in building a new subway under New York City. Almost as soon as the Fumatic Transit Tunnel opened to the public, the company would begin its campaign to expand the railroad and build a complete underground railroad system running from Harlem down to Battery. With the help of Boss Tweed, of all people, the Beach Fumatic Transit Bill would be proposed giving just that permission to the Beachumatic Transit Company. After a long battle in court, including many other competitors trying to build a transportation method across New York City, the Beachumatic Transit Bill would be rejected in favor of a more plausible mode of transportation. With his bill being rejected, this meant for Alfred Ely Beach that he had to wait another year to 1873 with the public approval slowly diminishing in order to get his dream charter to build his dream subway system. This attempt at gaining a new charter would ultimately fail for Beach, but Beach still had it in him and knew his innovation could be something. So Beach would go and use one of his most important assets, his writing, and try to gain public opinion next year by changing the course of history and the whole debacle with the Beach Rheumatic Transit Bill. In 1872, Alfred Ely Beach would summarize his company's position in a booklet called the Broadway Underground Railway. In this booklet, Alfred Beach would not mention that Boss Tweed played a crucial role in helping them obtain the Beach Rheumatic Transit Bill of 1871. Instead, Alfred Beach would take advantage of the politics going on around Boss Tweed at the time. Beach would develop a false narrative. Boss Tweed was against Beach and that Boss Tweed played a crucial role in the failure of the 1871 charter. At this time, Cornelius Vanderbilt were already demonstrating that it was possible to run an underground railroad system. These promotional pamphlets and booklets did not help to spur any new interest in the Beach Rheumatic Transit Company since its grand opening in 1870. After the initial charter in 1871, 
the Beachumatic Transit Company would apply for a new charter twice more. 1873 was the last straw for the Beachumatic Transit Company. At this time, Beach had already invested $305,000 of his own money. He was not making any money from ticket sales because it all went to charity. So Beach needed to find a way to get his charter fast because he was losing public interest as time went on. They say the fourth time's the charm. Eventually, in 1873, the Beachumatic Transit Bill would be passed. Sadly, it was too late for the Fumatic Transit Company at this time, as there was already companies building their own subways and transportation methods that seemed more plausible than the Beachumatic Transit design of Alfred Ely Beach. On top of this, the financial crisis of 1873 would strike the final blow to the Beachumatic Transit Company with basically all of its investors pulling their shares. At the end of 1873, the Beach Humatic Transit Company and Alfred Ely Beach, who had such great innovative ideas, was left with no investors and no public recognition. The five-year lease of the Devlin's clothing store sub-basement was set to expire. Although the company's expansion plans never came to light, Alfred Beach would try his best to keep the company's name alive, telling the media that plans were underway for the expansion of the Fumatic subway. Many believe that after the panic of 1873, the Beach Fumatic Transit Company was done, but this was not the case. Alfred Beach tried his best to keep his idea alive, but as new answers to the problem of transportation in New York City came to light, Alfred Ely Beach would quietly give up the lease on the basement of the Devlin's clothing store in December of 1875, as the future of his expansion of the Fumatic Transit subway looked bleak. After 1875 and the departure of Alfred Beach and his Beach Fumatic Transit Company from the sub-basement of 260 Broadway, not much is said in history about what happened to the station and all of its ordnance. Also, what happened to the tunnel between this time and when it was discovered in 1898. What we do know is that shortly after the departure of Beach in 1875, the Homer Fisher Rifle Store would open in the sub-basement of 260 Broadway. This rifle store, at the location of where the Beach Rheumatic Transit used to be located, boasted that it had its own range, where you could test your own guns before buying them. It was called the Creedmoor Junior Range, and from 1875 to 1878, we can infer that the station was most likely adopted into this rifle store, as well as the tunnel becoming the shooting range. In December of 1878, eight years after it was built, the tunnel would finally be sealed. Since it has served no purpose since Alfred Beach and the Beach Rheumatic Transit Company departed from the basement of 260 Broadway in December of 1875. After this, there is no documentation of the tunnel until 1898. Most likely during this time, the sub-basement was adopted by the Devlin's clothing store and used as extra storage. The landscape around 260 Broadway and City Hall Park would also drastically change during this time. Between 1878 and the late 1890s, one being the construction of the Home Life Insurance Company building that still stands next to 258 Broadway today. On January 1st, 1896, Alfred Ely Beach would pass away due to pneumonia. At the time of his death, the tunnel under Broadway and the car were still on the tracks, sealed behind the wall of the Devlin's clothing store sub-basement. Alfred Beach would be honored in the Scientific American for his work as an inventor and publisher. Before his demise, Alfred Ely Beach was able to experience the emergence of the elevated railways throughout New York City, which elevated railways was in the beach Humatic dispatch that Alfred Ely Beach made all that time ago in his original proposal to build a subway throughout New York City. If only he knew that in 10 years, the IRT would build its City Hall station and the modern day subway we all know today would be created right down the block from where Alfred Beach had his Warren Street station and the Alfred Beach Humatic tunnel 30 years prior. By 1898, the Beach Humatic transit had become obscure in history, with only Frederick Beach and those who were around during the time when the demonstration line was open being the only people who had faint memories of this lost subway. Two years after the death of Alfred Ely Beach, in 1898, 
the Beachumatic Transit would be in the spotlight again. On December 4th, 1898, 260 Broadway, now known as the Rogers Pete Building, would be destroyed in a spectacular fire. Here's the detailed descriptions, including the timestamps of the fire, if you'd like to read it. Basically, the fire started in the basement of the Rogers Peep Building or 260 Broadway. It was not described if this fire started in the portion where the offices of the beach Matic Transit were located or if the fire was started in the lower sub-basement where the waiting room and any of its ordnance, if they still lasted till this time and the tunnel entrance would have been. At the same time, there was a storm going on that produced hurricane-like winds that made it impossible for the firemen to fight the fire. The firemen had to let the fire burn until December 5th. This meant that the entire building would be engulfed at 260 Broadway. This would also damage the upper floors of the Home Life Insurance Company building next door, but it still stands today. By the morning of December 7th, 1898, the old Devlin's building at 260 Broadway was resulted to rubble. If any traces of the station or the machinery were to have survived up to this point, they were most definitely destroyed along with the fire. It is important to note that the tunnel that was sealed by the Home Fisher Rifle Company in 1878 was left virtually untouched by the fire. This also meant that the tunnel has been sitting for over 25 years, untouched by the elements, waiting to be revealed. This unwanted attention at 260 Broadway in 1898 would rekindle newfound fame for the beach rheumatic transit. Here is a reference that would be made from the Times and Tribune after the fire. By April of 1899, the rubble was removed out of the basement of 260 Broadway, enough where you were able to see the remnants of the old portal of the sealed tunnel. Breaking through the sealed wall, the workers would unveil the tunnel, which had been sealed for almost 22 years. It was instantly apparent to the workers that the tunnel was left in immaculate condition for its age. They even found the car, which was at the dead end of Murray Street, still left in its same spot it was most likely rolled into by the Home Fisher Rifle Company in 1878. As the word spread, eventually journalists would visit the tunnel and Stanley Yale Beach, the son of Frederick Beach and grandson of Alfred Beach, would be invited to visit the tunnel. The fame was short-lived though, and the tunnel entrance from the Warren Street Station side of the beach Rheumatic Transit Tunnel would be sealed for good. A year later, by 1900, the current building, 258 Broadway, would be already complete. The portal entrance to the beach Rheumatic Transit Tunnel was most likely incorporated to the modern day sub-basement wall of 258 Broadway. With the station completely destroyed, the only remnants that remained of Beach's invention was the tunnel and the car that would remain sealed for another 10 or so years until it would be revealed again, but in the way of workers building the modern day subway. This rediscovery in 1899 would spark a new interest in the lore of Beach. Now among historians, Frederick Beach would play a part in keeping the lore of his father's ambition alive by pointing out to those who were unaware, a rusty grate located in the City Hall Park across from Murray Street. This grate was now the only entrance to the Beach Tunnel now that the tunnel entrance from Warren Street was sealed for good. There will be a few references to the beach tunnel from the tunnel ceiling in 1899 until around 10 years later. By early 1910, the IRT subway line and the City Hall station had already proven to be New York's prime mode of transportation and an expansion down Broadway was in the works. The construction of the modern day BMT line, its proposed City Hall station was underway and the proposed path would intercept where the beach tunnel was located. This meant someone would be needed to demolish the beach tunnel to make way for the new Broadway tunnel. And that happened on January 2nd, 1912, when the Degnan Contracting Company was awarded the contract to build the section two of the Broadway subway. Once this was announced and construction of the new tunnel was underway, Journalists from the Times would take note that it was only a couple months until the beach tunnel would be uncovered again for its final time. No more than a few weeks after this was announced, a party of officials from Degnan Contracting and the Public Service Commission would formally enter the tunnel through the rusted grate in City Hall Park across from Murray Street. Here's a description from the New York Times describing the final expedition to the beach tunnel in 1912. After claiming the tunnel, the next day, the Degnan Contracting Company 
would begin the demolishing of the beach tunnel. Funnily enough, a few weeks after the company would begin demolishing the tunnel, the now owners of the Beachumatic Transit Company, which involved the New York Parcel Dispatch Company, would try to sue the Degnan Contracting Company for obstruction of property as they claimed that the Beachumatic Transit Tunnel still belong to them. After leaving the tunnel practically abandoned for over 40 years, it is important to note that these people who tried to sue the Degnan Contracting Company had no association with Beach. With Alfred Beach and the original owners of the Beach Traumatic Transit Company having left the company a long time ago. But I don't see how this claim had any virginity behind it because the company did leave the tunnel abandoned for so long. It was most likely a cash grab. Despite this, by July 1912, the Degnan Contracting Company excavated the beach tunnel, eventually unveiling Beach's tunneling shield that was left behind the tunnel wall at the end of Murray Street after the tunnel was completed in 1869. Frederick Beach, who was now 70 years old at this time, would be invited to go see the shield before the tunneling shield was eventually cut up by December 2nd, 1912, so that it can be removed. Frederick Beach would be reunited with the tunnel that he helped build way back in his 20s. But this time, instead of supervising its construction, he would be watching its demolition from the sidelines. Pieces of the first tunneling shield in North America would be spread across different hands, but as of today, nobody knows what happened to any of these relics. As for the train being completely made of wood and sitting in a dark tunnel for over 50 years, it was in bad condition. It was described as being brittle with very bad dry rot, with some of the car apparently falling apart when it was being removed. It is said in a source from 1918 that enough of the train was saved to assemble in the Office of the Public Service Commission's almost the complete end of the beach traumatic transit car. But after 1918, nothing is said of this. And the train was lost forever? If any of you guys know anything, let me know. It was also reported that the visitors in February of 1912 took souvenirs. Here are the names of the officials that were in charge of demolishing the beach traumatic transit tunnel. After 1918, there is no first-hand sources on the beach traumatic transit. After this date, all the references we have of the beach traumatic transit are from people like you and me who are just curious on the topic. In 1917, the BMT Broadway line would officially open almost 70 years after Alfred Beach had the idea. And with this construction of the official Broadway subway, the Beach subway would be lost. With any relics from this subway lost forever or in private hands, we are told that all traces of the tunnel underneath Broadway are most likely destroyed. Emphasis on the most likely. The media during the time of the demolishing of the Beachumatic Transit Tunnel tell us about what happens to physically everything in the tunnel. Stands out to me is how the media would focus on the story that sells, telling us what happened to the train car and the tunneling shield. We know based off of pictures of the tunneling shield that the brick section of the tunnel was 100% demolished. What the media fails to mention is what happened to Joseph Dixon's cast iron tunnel entrance? Surely if they were demolishing this section, it would be saved too, since it served a historical purpose being a part of the first underground tunnel in America. The only mentioning of this iron entrance of Dixon's tunnel during the time of demolition comes from one of the Degnan contractors who refers to Dixon's iron entrance as something that would be more difficult to destroy than it was to originally build. It sounds far-fetched, but this is the only reference we have, and it could hint at the existence or preservation of Dixon's iron tunnel entrance. This is something only the Degnan contractors who built this section of the Broadway tunnel would know. So why is there nothing said about the iron entrance? There is a belief that the corner property where the tunnel entrance to the Beachumatic Transit was was not within the property of City Hall and the proposed City Hall station. Could they have built around the iron entrance of Dixon? And could it still be buried behind the wall of 258 Broadway? Maybe. The only way to know for sure is to go into the sub-basement at 258 Broadway. Little did I know that this visit, I would learn a lot more about what happened around the area of the Beach Tunnel from 1912 to 1917 during the tunnel's demolition and the subsequent building of the modern day subway. I made a video where I went into the sub-basement of 258 Broadway. From this video, we can determine that no remnants of the station remain 
and that it was true that back in 1900, the entire sub basement was rebuilt. What struck me as odd was the weird vault under Broadway in the sub basement that looked like it served no purpose to the building other than as a storage for construction work. Little did I know that this room was the room where the Fumatic Transit used to be, and I was staring at where the portal to the corner entrance of the Fumatic Transit used to be located. Looking at this room, and now that we know the history, we can infer that between December of 1912, when the tunneling shield was removed and the beach tunnel was most likely completely demolished, and 1915, when it is estimated that the section of the BMT Broadway line between Warren Street and Murray Street was completed, the workers building this subway would break through the sub-basement wall of 258 Broadway that was built in 1900 in order to build the foundation for the new modern day subway. So we can conclude that the Dixon iron cast entrance to the Beach Fumatic Transit Tunnel was most likely destroyed when these workers broke through the sub-basement at 258 Broadway between 1912 and somewhere around 1915. Well this sounds plausible until you take a look at the odd construction of the corner foundation in the sub-basement at 258 Broadway. As you can see, the subway foundation cuts in half. Oddly enough, this cutoff point in the foundation looks to start and end in the exact location where we know the Beachumatic Transit entrance used to be. I do not know what this box leads to. I believe that the contractors building this built the foundation in this way in order to block anybody that is curious. And inside this part of the foundation most likely carries utilities because I doubt that they would waste concrete just for the sole purpose of blocking adventurers like me and you. So let me give you some perspective. Towards the right of this picture would be the vent that is currently at the corner of Warren Street today. The brick wall of the original sub-basement of 258 Broadway is still there above the foundation that was constructed around 1915. That means whatever is behind this part of the brick wall is original from when the sub-basement was rebuilt in 1900 during a time when the Beachumatic Transit Tunnel still existed underneath Broadway. Did the contractors not have permission to destroy this corner part of the sub-basement foundation? That would mean that some of the beach tunnels still could exist behind this wall. Here is my take on what might have happened. Going back to some time between 1912 and 1915, the contractors destroying the Beachumatic Tunnel realized that this iron section would be too much of a hassle to destroy, so they had to figure out a way to build around it. Sealing the iron part of the tunnel where it met the brick part of the tunnel, which would mean that the iron curve of the tunnel would still remain under the floor today and would most likely end where the current property of 258 Broadway ends today. I will go back to the highlighted picture I showed you previously in the video showing you what I believe still exists. Also on Google Earth, there are still some questions we could ask. Like, why wouldn't they just put concrete through the whole foundation? And also, when we look back to pictures of the Fumatic Transit, we know that the floor where the tracks are located was lower than the regular sub-basement floor. Xmetal1287 on YouTube would bring this to my attention in the last video that I posted. And it does make sense. Could the people who built 258 Broadway have filled in this little area between where the tracks were and where the sealed tunnel entrance was when they were rebuilding the sub-basement in order to make the basement floor flush. That would also explain why the bottom floor of the sub-basement and the corner area where the subway entrance used to be looks so drastically different from pictures that we have of the beach rheumatic transit from 1870. So then if this little area where passengers would go down the stairs and enter the train was concreted up, that would validate the theory that the contractors would build around the tunnel, only covering half of the foundation or the remaining top half of the tunnel since the bottom half of the entrance of the tunnel was buried under the floor of the concrete in the sub-basement at 258 Broadway. One way to know for sure would be to get into the vent under the corner of Warren Street and see the construction for ourselves from the other side of the wall. This would debunk any rumors as to if the iron entrance still exists. So I bought a boroscope and here's the footage of going inside the vent at the corner of Warren Street. And I'll try to return and get better footage in the future. But I will give you some perspective. Behind the wall to the left would be the Dixon iron entrance. 
and to the right would be the end of the wall to this vent. You can even see the opening on this right side of the wall that leads to the other vents leading all the way down from the corner of Warren Street to Murray Street. I believe if you were to stand right at that spot where the opening is on the right side of this vent and look down towards Murray Street, you would see a straight tunnel down to Murray Street, which would be similar to what people would have saw back in the day when the beach tunnel was there, or what the Degnan contractors saw building the modern day subway. Trying to focus on this footage, we can see that this vent leads down, probably into the lower level of the City Hall station, which is not used today. It is important to note that there is a wide enough area between where the modern day City Hall Station and the downtown R train runs and to where I believe the iron section of the Beachumatic Transit Tunnel could exist. Going back to the vent, there is not much I could use from this footage to completely debunk my theory, but there's also not enough footage to completely confirm my theory either. Maybe the ceiling of the inside of this vent could give us some answers. You let me know what you guys think. The only way to know for sure what happened to the Dixon Iron entrance would be to look behind the wall ourselves. Similar to the workers building 258 Broadway did back in 1899. And find out for sure. We know for sure that whatever is behind that brick at the sub-basement of 258 Broadway where the tunnel entrance used to be was left untouched since this brick is original from 1900. I'm working on finding a way to gain permission to get behind this brick wall and finally solve the answer as to what happened to the Dixon Iron Entrance, the last remaining piece of the beach tunnel. Hopefully someone watching this video might be able to answer these questions or may even have some new information. I'd love to know in the comments. I need your help to spread this video and keep the history of the Fumatic Transit alive since there are currently not many sources that show the true story of this important part of New York City history. Hopefully you enjoyed this not too short history lesson along with my take on this information. What are your thoughts? And I also wonder if you agree that any of the beach tunnel might still exist. Let me know. I would just like to make an important disclaimer regarding my footage of 258 Broadway and the sub-basement of 258 Broadway. I do not suggest anyone attempt to visit 258 Broadway looking for answers to what happened to the beach rheumatic transit. They should have all been answered in this video. I am in contact with the building owners before I film anything and I have gained permission to be there. This is a residential building and therefore we should respect the tenants of 258 Broadway. I'd like to thank Joseph Brennan who provided most of the information for this video and made it much easier to make. Mr. Brennan is responsible for all of the excerpts in this video and I will link in the description his full detailed history of the beach rheumatic transit where I got all the information for this video from. It is also a very interesting read if you enjoy subway history. I'd also like to thank the communities on Reddit, especially the NYC Rail community for helping me gather information on this topic. Or a couple months ago, I didn't even know anything about this topic. Thank you to all my new subscribers, of course, and the commenters. You guys are the reason why I was motivated to make this video at all. Three lovers, I hope you enjoyed this video and have a nice day.